It's time now for coronavirus life after lockdown. And today we're focusing on sport and how the pandemic has changed one of the few activities that has the power to unite the world. Let's show you some stats to give you a snapshot of what's changed already. Already, Nearly 50,000 major sporting events were scheduled for 2020, but COVID-19 and measures like social distancing and travel bans mean only around half of them are likely to take place by the end of the year. The Olympics and European football championships, the Euros, are some of the major live sporting events that have been postponed until at least next year as well. And can you imagine the impact this is all having on the athletes? Thousands have spent years training for moments that may not happen now and for the Olympics too. Footballers, some of the best paid stars in the world, they're struggling. One survey highlighting a sharp rise in anxiety and depression amongst players. So I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by Lord Sebastian Coe. He is the president of World Athletics and former chair of the London 2012 Olympic Organising Committee. Dr Brian McCloskey, he is a public health advisor on mass gatherings, the director of the World Health Organization's Centre of Mass Gatherings and Global Health Security. And Jonas Burr Hoffman, the general secretary of the Football Players Union. Uh, so good to have you all with us. I'm delighted. Uh, Seb Coe, can I start with you? I mean, I'm not the only one with a massive hole in my life right now because of the lack of live sport. Tell us what the new normal is going to look like when this pandemic finally comes to an end. Well, it's going to look slightly more complicated probably than it certainly looks at this moment. Uh, let me just give you one example of the challenge. Yes, you mentioned in, in your opening remarks about the Olympic Games moving from 20 to 21. That meant that World Athletics had to move its World Championships from 21 to 22. And then you collide in a season that already has the Commonwealth Games and the European Championships. But that would have been a big enough challenge under any circumstances to bring those three events together in one year. But then to try to choreograph it all within basically about six and a half, seven weeks, I, I think that probably... Uh, stands alone uh, uh, as an example of, of complexity. So, What about some were... pretty fundamental questions, though? Like, we're all expected to social distance at the moment. How do you hold athletics events and maintain social distancing? Uh, well, we're talk you're, I was talking specifically about the new season in 2022. Uh, but, look, uh, there are occasions, and we have to say it through gritted teeth, those of us who love sport and know that sport's a great driver, where sport actually has to take a back seat. And we are trying our very best to get competitions back up and running for our competitors. Uh, that's what they want. I speak to them all the time. But we also know that we have to do it in an environment where there are judgments that are going to be made by public health authorities, governments. Uh, we don't want the athletes to be put into a difficult, dangerous, injurious position, and, and particularly not just for themselves, but the risk of, in, uh, of, of infecting their loved ones and families. So this is a complicated landscape. Um, but, you know, you know I, I have to say, and we all hope that the, uh, the, the virus is contained uh, and that we are able to get athletes back into competition, but only when it is safe and sound to do so. And we've had some very ingenious efforts, uh, including uh, something that we're going to announce later in the week about having athletes competing in a competition. It will be behind closed doors and then being able to engage at the same time with athletes from other parts of the world in, in competitions. So, look, yeah, nothing is ideal at the moment, but we live in we live in an extraordinarily challenging environment. For sport Brian, Brian, what would you need to see in order to be confident that the Olympics can take place next year? Because we've had epidemiologists in Japan today say they're confident that maybe Japan can get it under control, but not other countries. I think for any country in any games, the first thing we have to see is that there are signs that the epidemic is under control and preferably on a downslope. But every event and every sport has to be judged in its own context and a proper risk assessment. We need to look at what are the risks the event brings, what are the things that we can do to reduce those risks, and then make a judgment about the balance. And that will be in cooperation with public health authorities and government, as well as the federations and the athletes. It's doable, but we'll do it very slowly, very carefully, and we'll phase things in one by one as it's safe to do so. But for the Olympics to go ahead, Brian, would you need to see the pandemic contained all over the world in all countries? 
Um, not necessarily completely, because that may not ever happen. But what we have to say is, yes, you know, we need to see it as proper international travel so that the teams and the athletes, the officials and the spectators can all get in and out of Japan easily. We need to see that the risk in Japan itself is relatively low and that people won't bring another risk back to their home countries. All of that is doable, but it depends on the state of the epidemic. It depends on whether there are therapeutics and vaccines. It's doable, but we have to be very careful and take it step by step. We've got 15 months yet for the Olympics to plan that. We will get there, but it will require an awful lot of work. Jonas, in the past hour or so, we've heard from the Bundesliga. They'd like things to get underway in May. Does that seem realistic to you, that the government will give the green light to that? I'm German, but I wouldn't uh, <laughs> dare to interpret the opinion of the German government on this. Um, I think there is a couple of fundamental questions, of course, that you need to ask yourself um, in any country where this might be considered. The one, and that's the first and foremost one, is where is society in terms of this pandemic right now? Um, are testing capacities at a level for the ordinary um, people, for everybody, um, that it would be even conceivable to consider using many of those tests on athletes and their entourages? Um, but also, where are we in terms of the, the social distancing environment? What's the acceptance? Um, is, it, is it socially actually contributing to a normalization, or is it something that could actually offend many people who would... Um, who would see, um, well, a stark difference with um, how some parts of society are treated and others. That requires a lot of um, good communication and fair engagement with the people. Um, but then, of course, um, the big question is, football being a contact sport, um, what's the risk of transmission? Now, Germany, the way that we understand the plan that the Bundesliga is working on, um, would be working on the, on the basis of um, incredibly high testing numbers. Um, but even then, you know, we have, to, we have to bear in mind that every one of those players after training will go home unless you put them into a quarantine environment like some countries are discussing, which has massive social consequences as well and logistical ones. But every time they go home, they may come back the next day with a different medical situation that they arrived the day before. So theoretically, if you wanted to really control that risk um, of them transmitting a disease to their teammates, to other staff members, and thereby spreading something um, to a broader community, you would basically have to be almost assured of their not being contagious whenever they step on the field. And that is, of course, a very, very high threshold. Um, I don't want to judge whether Germany and football here can pull it off in the next few weeks, but um, so far, there are many hurdles that we see, um, well, doubtful that that can be climbed. And Jonas, what about uh, resolving these issues around contracts and transfers, particularly if many leagues around Europe are extended? Well, it's, um, it's, uh, it's complex. Um, I was part of the FIFA task force that looked at these matters and tried to give some recommendations. Um, unfortunately, a one-size-fits-all um, approach to this is simply legally not possible. Um, there are contracts in place and they were signed with a certain intention. And the parties need to ultimately agree on whether they want to extend those or not. Um, the big concern for us, frankly, we represent, of course, not just players on the Bundesliga and Premier League level. We represent players in 65 countries around the world. Most of them are nowhere near the remuneration that um, oftentimes is talked about in public. And for them, a potential non-extension of their contract or a prolonged period where they might be unemployed because the clubs would let them go, um, okay. will mean um, very, uh, very severe social consequences, yeah. like, of course, many other people are facing in society. And it's, it's not more important that athletes have these concerns, but they're actually very similar at the, at the broadest base of football and, of course, all the other sports. Sebko, can I ask you about that, about how, as an athlete, you cope right now when possibly you've been training and working and dreaming, mentally preparing for something for years and years and years to find out that it's possibly been postponed or cancelled. What are athletes going through? Oh, look, when we pushed very hard for the games to be postponed, we did so with exactly that in mind. The athletes were on an emotional roller coaster. You know, they were risking their own. Uh, they were risking their own health and, by, as I said, by implication, the health of, of their families and, and loved ones. So, look, the smart athletes, the ones that have got age on their side, the ones that have got good coaches, great federations, are going to be able to think their way through this. Not everyone will do that, but I think a good chunk of those that have a little bit of time on their side will be back competing. And athletes are incredibly focused and do remember, unlike the rest of us, uh, athletes work remotely. They've got, they're into that world. You know, if you're a competitor in your 
early 20s, then you've probably worked remotely for most of your life and you've used technology in the way we're all sort of coming to terms with it. Let me introduce something else that's important here because, look, of course, as a Federation president, I recognize the importance of, of tracking the virus, the, of making sure we're not in, in breach of any government or, or public health authority uh, guidelines. But there is another consideration that we have to have uh, in, in any sport, and that is, when is it right for the athletes to come back? You could be out of lockdown, you could be in, in leaving uh, the, the pandemic, but there are other considerations. How are we going to give the athletes enough time to get back into training? Most of them are confined to houses. They can keep physically in reasonable shape, but it doesn't, apply, it doesn't allow them to apply the specificity of throwing a javelin or a shot put or, or dealing with, with some of the technicalities of hurdles. We also don't want them back into that landscape until we are absolutely sure uh, that we have our anti-doping processes uh, up and running. So yes, of course this is about science. Yes, of course it is about guidance uh, from governments, but it is also a sporting issue about when is it right to, to have athletes coming back into competitions such that those competitions uh, 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 the integrity of those competitions is, isn't a question, and all this has to come together. It probably is a more complicated landscape, frankly, for those of us in sport having to balance all those considerations that we've discussed with the, additional, with the additionality of when is it right for the athletes to be able to come back into competition. And adding to that, Brian, I have to say it's this idea as well, these athletes might have to prepare for competing behind closed doors. Is that the kind of recommendations we're going to be seeing too now? I mean, that's a possibility, but not necessarily the best one. It, it raises all sorts of complications in itself. But I think there are some important issues, as Seb says, about getting athletes back into training. But I think there's also a question about whether we should be looking at this from the top or the bottom. Is it more important to get the major events back started or is it more important to get the community back involved in sport? And I think if you look at it from the bottom and get community events starting, that starts to also open up opportunities about how you do the training. It also op op opens up the way in which officials can start to rehearse and practice the sort of things they might do to reduce the risk at a bigger event and learn from those smaller events, get the community behind you, get community confidence and then build up to the bigger events as and when we can. Uh, Jonas, we don't have much time and I wanted to talk about what it means for corporate sponsorship uh, and the money involved, particularly with broadcasting rights and things. But can I ask you particularly about the delay we've heard today to the Women's World Cup, not now till 2022. How much of a blow is that for women's football, for instance, which really needs the international games? Yeah, you're absolutely correct about this. Um, the women's game has been on a fantastic trajectory the last few years. Um, public attention is finally catching up with um, what we believe it deserves. Um, it obviously comes from a history of, of frankly neglect and therefore these international events which bring together not just the highest quality of the game but also of course a little bit the patriotism and the attention that we need are incredibly important and just looking at it from the players perspective there is you know, a, a large number of players who have essentially built their careers around their appearance in a World Cup or on the women's side in, a, in, a, in an Olympics, simply because it is sometimes the only platform when you come from a smaller footballing nation where clubs who actually do provide professional opportunities see you and then recruit you. Now, that being um, pushed back by a year um, is substantial, um, but frankly, we are overall a little bit concerned that uh, it's typically one of those things where you might fear the cuts may hurt the most, simply because the underbelly, um, the structure the public attention that the men's footballing game has is simply not yet the same. And um, of course, you ask yourself a question about you can immediately now be triggered, of course, by the commercial interest and many of the jobs of our members are, are at risk. So we look at that, of course, but I think in rebuilding sport um, post Corona or during this, um, we also need to be looking at, okay, around which values do we actually want to rebuild it and shouldn't the, the principle of equality that has um, you know, trickled more and more into football, shouldn't that be a main pillar? And then how can we build it? What are the innovative I, ideas oh, to I actually mean, put that, it on the map we'll have to and make leave it, it big? I'm afraid on that positive note and the talk about more collaboration and innovation, which is to come. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here on BBC World News.